So uh, it's a great pleasure uh, uh, to have today Mateus uh, Trotaviana for this uh, session of the IBM for Policy Seminar. So Mateus uh, is a PhD student at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. is also visiting uh, Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and we will present a paper on uh, how monetary policy can stabilize an unstable economy. So uh, please, uh, Matteus, the, uh, the floor is yours. So you have 40, 45 minutes, as I told you, and then there will be time for questions. Uh, I'm also recording the, uh, the seminar, okay? Uh, following your, uh, your permission, okay? So please go ahead. Thank you, Mauro. Thank you very much. Thank you all for the opportunity to present here. Uh, or already did my uh, specifications. I'm a PhD candidate at Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and I will present this uh, paper that is basically the work of my PhD thesis. So this presentation here is part of my PhD thesis, which is uh, still ongoing, but I pretend to defend it and to present it uh, very soon. So every suggestions, critiques, ideas, and everything from you will be very positive for me. Okay, so I strongly encourage you to criticize, uh, give ideas or everything on this presentation. It's also, as the, the PhD thesis is also a part of a bigger project, a bigger research effort to develop this model which was already developed in the Federal University by my supervisors, Mario Pozes and Ster Dweck. So the idea was to turn the model more user-friendly, translate it to English. Uh, so they calibrated so there is this research effort that is not in the presentation, but it's part of this project. So what, what are our motivations? Well, the global financial crisis showed uh, the relevance of instability again, right? And stabilization measures, because we had 20 years or more of the great moderation. Economists used to think they uh, knew how to obtain uh, instability. So instability was not the, the problem anymore. So uh, the new consensus we consolidated those ideas of uh, stabilization and how to provide it, especially via uh, monetary policy following uh, the Taylor rule. But the, the crisis put in check uh, the three pillars of the new consensus, the theory that wasn't able to explain the crisis, the models that wasn't able to predict the crisis and the policy recommendations. Uh, that were not uh, effective to recover from the crisis, since many authors show that the, the policy implementation during and after the crisis, the crisis following the new consensus contributed to the slow recovery after the 2008-2009 crisis. And then we had last year the, the COVID-19 crisis, which is not... Uh, on, on the source, on the origin. It's not an economic crisis, but it has uh, very important economic consequences. So will, will we use the same policy recommendations again uh, to uh, face this crisis, or we will try to search for an adequate theoretical and methodological framework to identify uh, other possible policies, probably best policies to face this crisis and the next ones. So this is our motivation. But the basic idea uh, of the new consensus was that monetary policy uh, following a, a Taylor rule was enough, had all the power to provide both output and price stability. Why? Well, we will discuss the five or six uh, traditional transmission mechanisms of monetary policy. Uh, I will try to be brief, but we have the, the interest rate channel, uh, the asset price channel to be via um, 
well, the fact the banking lending channel and the balance sheet channel that can be uh, grouped in the credit channel, the expectations, which was very popular in the consensus, and the, ex the traditional exchange rate channel that was kind of uh, not discussed, especially in the US, they don't have that problem, but for other uh, countries, it's very relevant. So those five channels or six, they have uh, uh, one thing that is very similar, which is this last step here, the link from demand to prices. So regardless of which channel, the discussion on the new consensus was which channel is more relevant or is more powerful or each one is stronger, but it really doesn't matter because the final effect is all, always a, a positive relation from demand to prices and always a negative correlation from the basic interest rate to demand. Okay, uh, regardless of which channel is stronger or not, which is operating or not. Uh, but the final effect from the basic interest rate to demand is always uh, a negative correlation and from demand to prices is always positive. Therefore, monetary, the, the, the way to control uh, inflation is by reducing demand and therefore monetary policy uh, via its only instrument, the basic interest rate, was enough to provide both uh, output stability, controlling aggregate demand, and price stability. Okay, at least uh, in the long run, that is this uh, hypothesis of perfect competition. Uh, so several authors argue that in the long run, price inflation is always a matter of, of excess demand. So that's why uh, this happens here. But if, if we take into consideration other theories, alternative explanations, we need to find, uh, we need to search for uh, alternative channels. So if, if we relax this hypothesis of perfect competition, of this necessary link from demand to prices, uh, for instance, if we consider some oligopolistic competition that firms uh, set prices by a, a markup over costs, there are pro probably other channels, not only other channels from the basic interest rate to demand, but other cha direct channels <laughs> from the rate to prices, not necessarily passing to demand. So we can separate this. We can separate the links from the basic interest rate to demand and the links to prices. And finally, we check again if the if that is uh, a link between the demand to prices, and if that is that is probably not explained by perfect competition, or and it's probably explained by another theory. So, what are possible other channels? Well, the first one is the exchange rate cost channel. Uh, if we assume a, a flexible exchange rate regime, uh, the basic interest rate affect the net capital flows that affect the exchange rate. Uh, the traditional exchange rate channel uh, says that the change in the exchange rate, rate will affect the volume of both exports and imports, so affecting aggregate demand. But this alternative channel here um, says that the changes in the exchange rate can affect the cost of imported inputs, therefore, uh, the cost of, for the firms yeah. and the price, the reference price of the foreign uh, competition, right? So firms can pass these two prices, uh, but this effect here depends on, on the market competition, on, on firms' uh, market share and so on. But that is this channel here, which has the same final effect of the, the traditional ones. So increasing the basic interest rate will decrease prices, okay? But that is this also this perverse or inverse uh, channel. That is the interest rate cost channel. If firms need finance uh, to produce, uh, interest is a cost, right? Uh, it's a financial cost for the firms and they can not always, but they can uh, pass this to prices. So an increase in the basic interest rate, uh, this is wrong, sorry, 
uh, will increase uh, the cost of loans for production, which is a financial cost that will increase prices. The link from demand is also that that is this uh, literature, recent recent literature that is investigating the relationship the relationship, especially in Europe. Uh, between the basic interest rate and bank profitability, because longer periods of lower of low basic interest rate affect bank profitability and their capacity of uh, providing loans, therefore affecting investment and demand. This is also a, a different relationship, a positive one, that a decrease in the basic interest rate will decrease, probably will decrease uh, demand. Finally, the link from demand to prices. Well, uh, in some markets, it's possible to have uh, the perfect competition. So flex price markets can have this tr traditional conventional relationship. But also, uh, for instance, let's say that firms are operating above its desired capacity, then it will probably employ, uh, if they have different vintages of capitals, capitals with different productivity, they will probably employ less productive capitals. Not, I'm not talking about uh, uh, workers, but uh, less productive capitals that can affect the average productivity, the wage cost, and probably affect prices. But the final effect from product productivity to prices will, of course, depend on the wage rate adjustment, right? Uh, and this is also affected by demand because of the traditional uh, distributive conflict theory uh, that when demand is high, uh, firms, uh, sorry, workers will have more bargaining power, will claim more uh, higher nominal wages that will probably be passed to prices. So it's possible to have some link from demand to price that's not necessarily the, the traditional perfect competition. However, this has a, a strong lag, right? Because the the wage adjustment is not depending on the economy. It's not uh, every production period. So our conclusion is the, 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 the final link from the basic interest rate to both to demand and to price is not always the one that the new consensus used to say, right? Because you can have a positive channel from the base rate to demand or a negative channel. So the, the final effect is uh, unclear. And you can, you can also have a positive effect on prices and a negative one, uh, again, directly on prices. So the, the final effect is unclear. And then the link from demand to price is not necessarily always the same. We need, uh, an, as we question the theory, we need now uh, our other another framework, another model, it's not the DSG models, uh, that can account for these uh, possibilities. So we need some kind of simulation model. Especially, we need some model that uh, integrates the ma micro aspects and the macro aspects, because the, 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 those authors here put a strong methodological critique on their analysis of monetary policy, that even if we consider those at the alternative channels, uh, the analysis in general, very aggregate, very macro. And you need to consider a uh, sectoral difference because you can have one sector that is highly influenced by the exchange rate, another one that is not. And also the, the firm level is very relevant because for instance, the financial channels like the banking range channels uh, really affect uh, smaller firms more than uh, bigger firms. So you need to take into consideration uh, both micro and sectoral aspects integrated. So we will use this model that is called macro, micro, multi-sectoral model, MMM to simplify, which was developed in the Federal uh, University of Rio de Janeiro, which is a model with strong Keynesian, Kaletskian, Schumpeterian, and Minskian uh, theoretical foundations. So the theory is different from the, the new consensus. Also, as I said, the model is multi-sectoral. That there are at least three sectors: one capital goods, one intermediate goods, and one uh, 
consumption good, although we can have n, n sectors of each type, but we use the, the smaller, uh, the simpler uh, specification. It's a disequilibrium model integrating micro and macro aspects, as everyone here already knows the, the basics of agent based model. Uh, so it's also stock and flow consistent and agent based, and especially it's a, a very important here. It's a theoretical model. Okay, although we can try to calibrate one parameter or or the structure to represent an economy, a specific economy, it's not calibrated with empirical data. Okay, uh, so our, our, as our model is theoretical, our conclusions is also are also uh, theoretical. So this is the basic structure of our model. It's a little bit uh, complex, but as I said, there are at least three sectors of capital goods, of consumption and intermediate goods. All firms, including the intermediate good firms, need intermediate uh, goods, inputs to produce, okay, in different amounts, depending on the technical coefficients, but all, all firms need inputs to produce. All firms, including capital good firms, need capital when they invest to, to meet the expected uh, long-term demand, okay? So they demand capital goods, they demand intermediate goods, and the consumption goods are demanded by the households, which are divided into income classes that are heterogeneously, uh, they are heterogeneous on how they appropriate the production income, wages and distributed profits, and how they consume. So they, their uh, propensity to consume is different. Uh, so we have the government that can provide demand, they can demand goods from uh, all three sectors, also provide income via government wages and counter cyclical unemployment benefits to the income classes, collecting both income taxes and indirect taxes from the firms. The model is open, is an open economy, so we have an external sector that um, uh, provides demands, uh, exports for the three sectors, and it also provides a supply for the imports for the consumption goods, the imports of the income classes, and intermediate and capital goods of all the firms. So there is a share of, of inputs and capital goods that are demanded uh, externally. Finally, which was introduced in my thesis, uh, the final sector is populated by heterogeneous banks that are regulated by uh, a base on like regulatory rule, and they pro they provide loans both to firms uh, and to income classes, collecting their deposits. Okay, and there are two types of loans: uh, short term to finance production, and long term to find to finance uh, firms' investment. And if there are two types of loans, the interest structure is also uh, different. The, the interest they pay on each type of loan is also different. So I'll present a, uh, a few equations, not all the equations of the model, just a few, especially related to the interest rate and the, the price formation. Okay, the basic interest rate, which is the, the one the government uh, pays on their bonds, uh, follows a single mandate table rule. Okay, uh, the interest rate on deposits is, is a negative spread and is the same for all the banks, but the interest rate on loans are different for each bank. Uh, it's a, an average, a weighted average between the, the, the rate desired by each bank B and the, aver the average interest rate of the financial sector following uh, uh, similar to the Kaletskian price equation that we'll see in a minute. Uh, although the empirical evidence showed that banks compete much more on credit, on uh, credit rationing, and less on interest, so this parameter here tends to be close to zero. But there is this possibility of, of different interest rates for each bank, both short term and long term. Okay, and long term, uh, the spread is higher than the, the short term. But this is the bank interest rate. 
the the interest rate the firm will pay is adjusted is adjusted is the the bank one plus a risk premium that depends on the firm specific debt rate total debt over total assets so that is a uh, risk premium added so this is the interest the firm i will pay on short term loans and long term loans and the relationship on of firms and banks are fixed. Uh, it's random, determined, and fixed to simplify. So, prices. Uh, the price of the firm I follows the Kaletskian equation, uh, which is a average, weighted average between the desired price and the reference price. And the reference price in a closed economy model, the traditional Kaletskian equation, is the sector average price but as our model is open we consider here the the external price of the sector of the same product the sector produces already adjusted to domestic currency and weighted by the share of exports over the total demand of the sector so higher is the the external sector participation higher will be the the weight on the external price. And if the economy is closed, so ex exports are zero, this equation is the same, exactly the same. This goes to zero. Uh, and the, the reference price will be the sector average price. The desired price is a desired markup over the unit variable cost, unless firms are highly indebted. So if they are uh, their debt rate is above their maximum, they will try to introduce some financial costs to this formation. So this is the, the interest cost uh, channel that we talked about that explains a lot of, of the, the price puzzle in the literature, the Gibson's paradox. So, but it's not always. In, in general, firms uh, only uh, add a markup over variable cost, but it's possible that they can add the unit financial cost on their price formation. The unit financial cost is all financial cost, interest and amortization over uh, uh, normal or desired productive capacity. This productive capacity is the desired uh, capacity utilization. And the unit variable cost is the sum of input costs and wage costs. Again, input cost is a weighted average between the, the domestic price of inputs and the external price of inputs already weight, uh, converted to domestic currency, weighted by the share of inputs, uh, of imported inputs, sorry. And the wage cost is the weight rate of the firm over the average productivity of the firm. Again, this is uh, firm level variables. It's not uh, sector or, or aggregate, this is firm level. The wage rate is adjusted, not, not every period, only four periods because our basic time period is a quarter. So annually, uh, based on past CPI inflation and productivity growth. However, the pass-through parameters are not fixed as the distributive, uh, distributive conflict theory that we talked about. Uh, when the sector, when employment in the sector is growing and firms are operating above the desired productive capacity, uh, workers gain some bargaining power. Therefore, these parameters uh, increase. By, by contrast, uh, when the employment is decreasing and firms are operating below desired capacity, uh, workers lose uh, bargaining power and firms re can reduce these pass-through parameters. To conclude, the desired market is not fixed. Uh, it can evolve based on firms, the evolution of firms' market share. However, it, uh, firms only increase their desired markup if their market share is above their desired level. So if it's below, they 
tend not to increase prices to gain enough competitiveness to reach their desired uh, market share. So this is a threshold. Above this, uh, market uh, markups can increase. So uh, the simulations, the model runs on LSD and is already there as an example model. So if you, if you download the, the latest version of LSD, the model is already there. And it's uh, freely available on my repository. So anyone can access. And we run 100 independent simulations, a uh, Monte Carlo experiment. Okay, and discarding the first 200 periods, leaving us with 400, which is equivalent to 100 years since each time period is acquired. I will present some results to just to uh, validate a little bit of the model, and then I will talk about some preliminary experiments I performed. Well, the model uh, is a model of endogenous growth. This is GDP consumption investment on, on logs. Okay, the model uh, generates endogenous growth and endogenous cycles. Okay, this is the filtered series. This is the cy cycle component of the filtered series. Uh, this is a, a table that presents the average value of a uh, few aggregate variables. Uh, this is just the Monte Carlo average of the time average of each variable, although we can see the, the trajectory the, on, on time. But this is just to illustrate a, a few things. Uh, capacity utilization effective is, on average, the desired level, which is 90%. Uh, the real annual GDP growth is, on average, 1%, is low, okay, but. Uh, it's positive and a few periods can provide a lower and higher growth rates. 11% of years, the, the model has a negative real GDP growth, which we consider a crisis. So 11% of the time uh, there is a crisis. And inflation is on average 1.8% annually. And we can see other variables like the government uh, debt over GDP, which is around 80%. Some uh, distributive variables, such as the profit rate, the profit share and wage share, and some financial variables, such as the average debt rate of the firms, which is around 50%, uh, roughly. And the credit rationing, uh, 80, only 85% of Credit demand is grand, so 15% is rationed. And a share, the share of firms that are Ponzi, speculative, and hedge firm, as the Minskian literature. Uh, so there are some considerable uh, financial instability. Let's say firms are 5% uh, of firms are Ponzi, and 70% of firms are speculative. Just to illustrate a few variables. This is the, the inflation rate. I'll, I'll talk about why this graph is here. And we can see that the basic interest rate follows a very similar dynamic since the, the Taylor rule has only one mandate. So this is the basic interest rate, very similar uh, dynamic, although there is some smoothing okay, in the model. So that's why the basic rate is not that volatile as inflation. Uh, here there are some sectoral variables, such a, uh, as the model is multi-sectoral. We want to analyze different sectors. They are heterogeneous. They are not the same. The, the price level are different. The, the markup is, uh, are different. And the average debt rate is also different. But the first experiment we ask, we, we do, the first question we ask is, OK, uh, the inflation rate, as we can see here, is on average 1.8% annually. Okay? And it's not that far away from 2%. Why? 2% is the, the value of the target inflation on our Taylor rule. So 
is this result a, a consequence of the Taylor rule or not? Uh, because in principle, it seems that the inf inflation is under control it's around the target. So let's, the first experiment we perform then is to try different inflation targets. So we tried for 2%, for 1.5, 1, uh, 0 0.5, and 0%. Our, again, all results here are preliminary. All, all of them need further investigation, but uh, this first approximation shows, at least for me, that uh, beyond a certain level of inflation, um, the Taylor rule cannot force uh, inflation beyond that level. It seems that the first reduction, that is some relative reduction from 2% uh, to, to 1.5, uh, uh, but beyond that level, probably there are other factors, what I call structural factors, factors that determine inflation. So some factors that the monetary policy cannot influence. So it's hard, even the most restrict, restrictive uh, Taylor rule cannot force inflation uh, roughly below 1.5 annually. Why this need for the investigation? Because um, this is one thing I, I, I want to do, I didn't do yet, but is to try to understand what are the factors that determine this level. Probably the sectoral relationships, the, the technical parameters, the, the level of the productiv productivity and inflation pass throughs. So the sectoral and micro aspects, the, the competitiveness, the, the competition elasticities of each sector probably are uh, some factors that influence this level. This needs uh, further investigation. But this is our first result. That are uh, that there is a, a structural level of inflation that monetary policy cannot force uh, beyond that level. But it seems that it can affect uh, at least a little bit uh, the volatility and a little bit the level. So we test different uh, transmission mechanisms. The first, this simulation that I'm presenting here, the baseline case. Um, allows every trans tra transmission mechanism that I talked about in the beginning. So every channel is on, let's say. And it's also the, it's following the new consensus policy mix recommendation. So uh, inflation target uh, Taylor rule, uh, a restrictive fiscal policy targeting debt to GDP ratio, and flexible exchange rate, just to, to say. The, the policy mix is the new consensus one. Well. So what we do now, we try to turn off each uh, transmission channel. So for instance, simulation two, we turn off the interest channel. We let the bank's interest rate fixed in relation to the base interest rate. So regardless of the basic rate level, the bank interest rate will be fixed. So uh, effectively, effectively turning off the interest rate channel. And we do this for the other channels like uh, the interest cost channel, the relationship with fiscal policy. I'll, I'll explain a little bit, this is very interesting. And uh, the credit channel, the, the traditional exchange rate channel uh, and the two sub channels of the exchange rate cost channel, the, the reference price and the input cost. So we turn off each of those channels. And if the simulation two, for instance, uh, provides uh, higher uh, volatility, both output and price volatility, than the baseline case, it means that this channel, it's, it's good. It's it, it, when it's on, it provides uh, stability. And when it's off, it's, uh, volatility increases. So uh, we want, uh, we want to check if this uh, value changes and we compare uh, them putting a, a ratio. This is, uh, is our result. So those are the ratios. Okay, so 0 0.97 means that the 
volatility of GDP growth in S2 is 97% of the volatility of GDP growth in S1. Okay, so when we turn off one of those channels and this ratio, ratio is lower than one, uh, it means that volatility here is lower than in the baseline case. So the channel is uh, has an adverse effect. So it's unstable, unstable, provides instability. And we can check for uh, CPI, inflation volatility, and output volatility. We find that the interest channel is not very effective. Uh, what we find very interesting, interesting is that the relationship with fiscal policy has a strong effect here. When we turn off the uh, fiscal policy of the new consensus, the restrictive fiscal policy, volatility decreases a lot. It's 50% of the original value. So, and this is the relationship between the monetary policy and fiscal policy, because uh, when there is a nominal shock, let's say, and the Taylor will increase the interest rate, it will affect, it will increase the, the government interest payment and everything constant, it will increase the, the nominal result uh, and the debt to GDP ratio will increase. So if it reaches the, the target or, or if it's close to the target, the government has to cut uh, primary spending to reach its debt to GDP ratio, uh, the target desired level. So this is the relationship between monetary policy and uh, fiscal policy that we turn off here. And it seems for us that the, the main channels that affect the monetary policy that has the, the expected result that provides stability is the exchange rate channel, both the traditional one and the exchange rate cost channel. As we can see here, when we turn them off, uh, both the level of CPI inflation increases and the volatility also increases. Okay. Uh, so this is probably the main uh, channel that uh, monetary policy can control price stability, stability uh, can provide price stability. However, if it provides uh, price stability, it also has a negative effect on output stability, as we can see here, for instance, S6, uh, S6 which is the exchange rate channel, the, when we turn it off, the price, uh, volatility increases, but the output volatility decreases. So it seems to, to have a, there is a trade-off uh, at least uh, in terms of volatility of price and output. Uh, we give a, here we perform a, a, a nominal shock, okay, um, at period 200. So here we increase, forcibly increase the external prices and it will be passed to domestic prices, but we, we, we perform a, a external price shock of 20 periods, so five years. And we can see that with the Taylor rule, with the new consensus policy mix, it takes almost, uh, 100 periods, which are 25 uh, years, for inflation to go back to the uh, past level. So it's, it's another evidence that the Taylor rule is not very effective to bring uh, inflation back to that level. So other factors are probably affecting um, this trajectory here. And that is also a forced recession during this time because when the the the, the shock is on uh, there is a, a small increase in demand because of the terms of trade 
and exports because the, the increase in the price, external price is higher than the, the increase of domestic prices, which increases uh, exports, net exports. So that is this is small uh, positive effect here. But when the when external prices go back to normal and the domestic prices are still uh, indexed, I increase, the increase in the interest rate uh, generates a forced recession here. So, as we can see, the relationship of monetary policy with fiscal policy and the exchange rate mainly uh, are the main ex explanations for those results. We ask, are there better policy mixes instead of the, the traditional new consensus combination? So we check other possible policy combinations. S1 is our baseline case of the new consensus, Taylor rule, primary surplus target uh, with that rate target uh, and flexible exchange rate. And we go uh, removing one of, one of the policies here, leaving only here only the Taylor rule. And for instance, S8, uh, it's none of these re recommendations like fixed Taylor rule, a fixed interest rate, uh, unconstrained fiscal policy, and fixed exchange rate. Uh, preliminary results show that uh, whenever we uh, uh, we have unconstrained fiscal policy, the long term uh, average real growth rate increases, but mainly volatility of GDP growth decreases, uh, and especially the the new consensus mix is the one with higher volatility, while the one with uh, totally opposite uh, has the lower uh, volatility. The same for the probability of crisis, it decreases a lot. And again, reinforcing the first result, uh, inflation seems to have uh, no effect here. So other, uh, other things are probably explaining this level of inflation, not the, the policy combination, but CPI uh, volatility decreases a lot, especially <laughs> the new consensus uh, uh, recommendation is again, the one with higher uh, price volatility. So those are preliminary results, but we uh, asked if the Taylor rule uh, is able to stabilize both output and prices in a financial complex evolving economy, uh, considering alternative theories, alternative uh, transmission mechanisms of monetary policy that brings ambiguous effect that ask for simulation. And then we use this, this model, this MMM model, uh, and our preliminary experiment showed that the basic interest rate, the Taylor rule, cannot force inflation below this structural level. Uh, it can reduce a little bit of uh, inflation volatility, especially via the exchange rate channels, but uh, with a burden of higher GDP uh, volatility. And are there other better policy mix? Probably. Yes, probably we can find, we need further uh, research, but we can probably find uh, better policies to face both output and price instability. As this metaphor by uh, Hansen says, uh, as monetary policy is a very erratic and precise gun, it's probably better not to fire it at all. So that's our conclusions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mateus, for uh, your uh, presentation. So we have some time for questions. So please uh, just uh, signal this by raising your hand or by writing in the chat, please.
Well, if there is no question, then maybe I can use my <laughs> power as chair to make some questions. Okay, so uh, I have two questions. The first is um, uh, concerns actually what you say in the conclusion. So, uh, well, you say that an economy with fixed interest rates, it means we know Taylor rule presents better results. Um, now, my one question is uh, actually, I mean, if you look at the actual behavior of, of, uh, uh, of central banks, actually it's quite persistent as far as, uh, I mean, as far as interest rates are concerned. But it, at least if you take the, especially the, the, the last, I mean, since 28. So uh, there is this idea of the Taylor rule where you should change interest rates in response to every change in inflation or the outward gap. But in fact, central banks in, in practice then are, uh, I mean, they are quite persistent when they're fixing the interest rate. So I'd like you to comment on this and, um, well, then also if your then your model can actually can capture the real behavior of interest rate or whether also this Taylor rule approach in the end is still uh, actual or not. I mean, I mean clearly it's very still very important in the in the mainstream literature, but in practice, if you see the real behavior of central banks, well, maybe it is not. This is the first question. The second question is about the model. So. Um, so I would like you to comment a little bit on the sources of heterogeneity in your model uh, of micro heterogeneity, uh, especially because you emphasize this issue of uh, financial stability. Um, so I would like to ask you whether you really looked at, for instance, how do firms behave uh, with different, in terms of uh, financial behavior, financial fragility over with different types of uh, interest rates. And second, how, how does your model uh, position with respect to the uh, existing models, agent-based models in the literature? Okay, that also have also analyzed the the, the impact of uh, of monetary policy as well as the interactions with monetary and fiscal policy. So I'll stop here. I think I, I made an abuse of my of my power as chair. Okay, in terms of time. Yeah. Uh... Maybe, maybe Matteo, there is also Mark who has a question. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. Thank you. Um, so, just and, and sorry if I missed it. I was just curious. So, your your model, you showed the slide where there was like after the shock, quite a lot of persistence. Um, you know, where where kind of the variables go back um, after like twenty five years or so to like the long term kind of equilibrium or, or average. Um, I'm just wondering how realistic that is or kind of what determines that um you know from a from a structural point of view and whether there's anything potentially you could do to speed up that you know persistence or maybe you think it's you know that's how the world looks like um so just curious to uh, if you could go a little bit more into detail thank you thank you for the question yeah well let's let me answer maul first uh, yes, that, that is some uh, persistent in the trajectory of the interest rates. And if I go back here to this equation of the basic interest rate uh, in the model, it is determined uh, this level here desired by the central bank is exogenous. So this bas basically defines the level of the central bank interest rate while the, the CPI uh, deviation from the target defines the, the volatility, right? And this needs for the uh, investigation. This is purely uh, exogenous. I tried to test different values uh, of it, but I didn't find uh, uh, significant results only on, on the level of the variables, but not on the trajectories. So, if you actually, if you can get, if you can give me, you all can give me um, ideas. Uh, as I said in the beginning, I'm open to to ideas on how to model this. And I don't want to use the term, but natural interest rate of the the central bank. Uh, I would appreciate. Uh, however, this is basically what defines the, the level 
of the interest rate, okay? Um, the firm level heterogeneity uh, is basically the one already consolidated in the literature. So uh, firms becomes, uh, become heterogeneous with, when they perform uh, technological search and they can perform both uh, process uh, innovation and product innovation. Okay, so it's not a model of homogeneous good, it's a heterogeneous good because the firms can uh, perform product innovation, can differenti differentiate themselves on the quality level of their product. product okay, those, those things, both the, the price uh, and the quality affect their competitiveness index that affect their market share and goes on. But uh, with the with relation to the financial aspects um, here, this desired uh, debt rate, this maximum debt rate of each specific firm can also evolve. Okay, it's not fixed and it depends on the net profits growth, past net profits growth. So firms are gaining market share, they are probably gaining more profits, uh, which allows uh, them to increase their maximum level of that rate, both perceived by them as a decisory variable and uh, defined by the banks. So because if uh, this defines the, the maximum level of loans a firm can uh, can have. Uh, so the banks, this, this affect the, the maximum level of loans a bank provide to that firm. So this is uh, basically a means of dynamics. So firms can be different on their debt rate, uh, both the desired and the effective uh, indebtedness. And this affect how they can get those loans on the banks, okay? Uh, the model in the literature, uh, I, I always say this, uh, that this, this is like a, a broader model of the K plus S <laughs> because it was developed by my supervisor, Stan Black, uh, mostly at the same time that Andrea Aroventini was developing his PhD thesis uh, in Santana. So Stead also did a, a visiting period in Santana. So the, both the, the structure of the model and the theory are very similar. So the model is very similar. I, I believe that the main difference is the, this introduction of the intermediate sector uh, here. This is not very uh, used in the literature of agent-based models. And this is very important to us because, as I, I showed, uh, the shocks uh, are especially passed to prices via these exchange rates, uh, this exchange um, rate cost channel, right? This one via the cost of imported inputs. So the, the cost of inputs is very important to this dynamic. And this is one of one of the main features of this model. And again, uh, we are using only one of each sector, but the model accounts for uh, N types of, uh, of each sector, okay? That's why it's multi-sectoral. Uh, that is also a version of the model that uh, is more aggregate, that has uh, eight sectors, for instance, okay? So that, that's basically how the model is in the literature. And Mark asked me about the persistency of the shock, right? So this shock here. Uh, well, as I said, the, the shock is forcibly very strong. <laughs> okay, you can see that for almost 50, uh, 50 years, the inf inflation is around this level and the shock is very, very, very strong. Therefore, the, the persistent is also very strong. This is not uh, too realistic, it's 
forcefully strong to see the impact. Okay. Uh, there are uh, some stochasticity on the price level of the external, on the external price of the, the goods, okay, including here, but here we force uh, a very strong shock. And this slow uh, tendency to go back to the past level really depends on the wage rate equation because the wage is indexed by the past CPI inflation. Okay, so the, the, the level of this parameter, although it can change, although it can be influenced by uh, the, the employment growth as the restrictive conflict theory puts, uh, we had to def define our uh, initial level, right? And so this level is currently uh, eight, uh, 80%, so 0 0.8, the, the average. This is very strong, okay? And uh, that is why the, the shock is very persistent. And again, I, I, I need further investigation, but I believe this, this also affects the, uh, the structural, structural level of inflation that we found, okay? Uh, of course, if we reduce the initial level of those parameters, uh, probably the the inflation, the structural level of inflation will also reduce. Okay. I don't know if I answered the questions. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, so, so the way I should think about this is like something like the oil price shock in the 70s, which is a massive shock, and then it yeah. takes some time to get back. So that's yeah, kind yeah. of the, exactly. so it's not just a regular, like, reasonable shock. It's like really a massive kind of. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. It's okay. not a, a regular yeah. shock. <laughs> forced shock, uh, forced strong shock. Yeah. Okay. Mauro, so, did, I, did I answer your questions? Yeah, the, the question is, okay, what is the, I have actually a related question. I mean, I mean okay, you said that the difference with respect to K plus S is the, actually the presence of uh, the intermediate good sector, but uh, can you just clarify what is the role played in the, by this sector more specifically? Yes. For instance, every firm, yeah. uh, regardless of the sector, needs an amount of inputs to produce. So they demand intermediate goods for those firms. Okay, And each sector has a technical coefficient. Let's say that the consumption sector is 0 0.5. So to produce one good, it needs uh, 0 0.5 inputs. Okay. So if, if, if he wants, if the firm wants to produce 10 consumption goods, it will demand five intermediate goods uh, to those firms. So it also creates this uh, demand propagation mechanism, okay? Uh, but it, it also has the cost effect because the, the intermediate sector has its own, own dynamics. It can uh, generate an, uh, inflation, domestic inflation. But as I put it here, there is also a share of those inputs that are uh, imported, okay? And the price of, okay, the model is, is open, but we cannot model the external sector very precisely. Otherwise we need a uh, two country model. So all variables related to the external sector are exogenous determined. So the price level of those, um, external products are determined by a fixed uh, growth rate with some uh, stochasticity, okay, with some randomness. So this affects also the, the cost that is passed, as I put it here, uh, here. The cost of the inputs, both domestic and external, uh, represent a significant part of the unit variable cost that is passed to prices, to at least to desired prices and to affected prices of each firm. Okay, so this sector is relevant, relevant not only on the, the flow of, of demand and income, but also on the, 
the price dynamics. Okay. Maybe one thing that you could emphasize, uh, and then I'll stop uh, because I don't no want problem. To, uh, uh, is the fact that actually this intermediate good sector has an immediate impact on prices, while the capital good has, uh, I mean, has an effect which is uh, distributed in time. Uh, because actually, the effect of the intermediate good is uh, by, I mean, it's via the traditional cost channel. I mean, I mean, if there is yes. an increase in cost in intermediate inputs, it will reflect in prices almost immediately. Through the capital goods sector, instead, there is also an important uh, effect which goes through excess demand in the sense that if there is not uh, uh, enough productive capacity, then you can have excess demand and inflation. So actually, the fact that you have this intermediate good sector together with the capital good sector allows you to see these two effects separately that uh, in, i mean this instead is not possible to do this to see this in other models i mean for instance in the k plus s we just have the, the capital good sector so we don't have an intermediate intermediate goods so actually we cannot see these effects so I, it's something that i will uh, emphasize okay when writing the final version of the paper yes thank you yeah oh. Thank you very much. So, are there uh, other questions? So, it seems not. So, if not, so I would like to thank uh, very much Mateus as well all the attendees for the seminar. So, thank you again. And uh, yes, and then you will receive uh, information about the next uh, seminars. Uh, on uh, of IBM for policy from the usual email address. Thank you very much and have a nice uh, nice day. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.